the story about Cambridge Analytica and possibly how it was influencing people's thoughts by analysing their psychology, that had been reported uh, a couple of years ago, but it, it, it didn't explode until you covered the story. What did it take to make that story go mainstream? When the first story about Cambridge Analytica was published, it was a, this amazing story, it's by this uh, Guardian journalist, Harry Davies, and he published it December 2015. And a lot of the facts that we, you know, we, we, we published last year were already out there. He, you know, he had a lot of it then. But at the time, Cambridge Analytica was working for Ted Cruz, who was an unsuccessful presidential candidate. And so it just didn't have that impact. And then what happened was there was um, a German journalist, Hannes Grasseger, who wrote a piece in November 2000, just really just after Trump got elected, and it, this motherboard article, and, and it, that it kind of exploded, and people were like, "Oh, actually, this is really creepy." But then, it, what it was, it was that thing for me was when I had this first conversation with Christopher Wiley, who went on to become the whistleblower, the guy with the yep. pink hair. That when I when I spoke to him, and he he told me, he, you know, he had done it he had got the Facebook data and he was freaked out now about how the way that it was being used and and it was just that thing of having a person describe it uh, uh, in this very articulate way and in a way which he was really concerned about because when we started talking in early 2017 the guy who'd been the vice president of Cambridge Analytica, Steve Bannon he was actually in the White House at that time, and he was Trump's chief strategist, and he was on the National Security Council. And Cambridge Analytica, we knew, had got contracts with the Pentagon. And so there was something very, very dark about that. But, so it was a combination of like timing and circumstance, and then this very powerful personal story, you know, from the guy who'd been there. Since you've broken the story, you've come in for all sorts of abuse online. Why do you think that is? I think, I do say, I do think it's this thing which is the, this, my, my, the biggest thing I've done, crime I've committed, is reporting while female. And um, I think, you know, the, the, uh, this story has involved a cast of enemies. Uh, very powerful individuals and organisations, you know, right up to Donald Trump, whose campaign used Cambridge Analytica. You know, half the British establishment, um, a whole load of millionaires and billionaires. And they, you know, I, I was castigated as a conspiracy theorist and a nutcase. And, you know, but it's, it's just, it keeps on being proven true. And we now have, you know, this multiple official investigations and rulings and so the only thing they really got left to use against me is massive misogyny mm -hmm. essentially so that's what they go for so on the one hand i do consider it a great compliment that they're so nasty to me but on the other hand it is you know it's where it's very it's very wearing on a day-to-day -day basis sort of just you know beneath every comment and you just get a crazy cat lady or she's out there with a cat she's home alone with her cat so she starts you know it's sort of it's just it's it is it's 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 it what's so sad is that we now live in this like our world has now normalized that so it's the same way that people make vile anti-semitic remarks on twitter and racist remarks and these kind of horrible sexist remarks are part of that and we didn't used to be like that. You know, there used to be a barrier about saying these things in public, and now there isn't. And now they're not even called out. It's, it's just totally normalised, and you're just supposed to put up with it. Do you, in a way, wish someone else had broken the story because of what you've gone through since? Or is the satisfaction of breaking it, does that outweigh it's it somehow? It's kind of, it's not, I wouldn't say it's satisfaction. That's not the thing, that's not, that's not, it's, it's more that it's completely fascinating and compelling and it has been like living a detective story in real time. So, so for that reason I can't be sorry, 
But at the same time, it has sort of taken over my life in a way which is bizarre and, and means that I, you know, I was just saying things like, I really like this basic things like the fact that lights, my lights don't work in my bathroom, which I haven't for like six months. I really like <laughs> There's some few things, key things it would be really good to get around to doing. I mean, you're smiling through it, and I wonder whether that's something you've trained yourself to do now, to smile through it. Um, I kind of, I mean, it's just that the, the whole story has been such a roller coaster. So it's just, it's, you know, it's gone from sort of triumph to disaster to like huge obstacle to, and it's, it's just incessantly been peaks and troughs. And so I, I, I know when it does get to me and when you do have these low points, I do, you know, you kind of know that, you know, something will happen. Some, the FTC will announce that it's about to fine Facebook five billion dollars or something. And you think, oh, well, that's kind of worthwhile then. That was sort of, that's a... So this is essentially about dark posts. This is about messages that appeared on some people's profiles because they were, in theory, susceptible to that particular type of messaging. What can we all do now? Is, is it just good enough that we know that these things are out there and we're aware? What, what can we do? No, I don't think it is good enough. I think the kind of idea that it's down to us as individuals to sort of police this thing is, is unrealistic because it's too sophisticated for us to, and it's, you know, it's too powerful. So this is where I think that politicians really have to step up. And I'm quite hardcore in that um, Mark Zuckerberg has, Parliament has asked him multiple times to come to Britain and answer these questions and, you know, be accountable. And he has every single time refused. Do you think the politicians are the right people to ask those questions? Or do you think you need proper technologically knowledgeable lawyers to do that anyway? I think, I think you kind of need both. But I think ultimately Parliament is the highest court in the land. And for me, this is, this is, this is a foreign company and it is beyond the rule of law. It's beyond the reach of British law. So I think there is absolutely no way that that company should be anywhere near a British election. And the fact that we are probably going to have some other big election at some point, we've done nothing about our laws, which we know do not work anymore. So our laws were like, per you know, they were, they were, essentially our electoral laws were devised in the 19th century. And they've been updated a bit, but they've, they've been completely superseded by the technology. So realistically, the media has always influenced elections. The media has evolved to become social media. It's not going back in the box. So even the, the style of messaging and the people who fund those messages can't always be traced back to a political party. They could be much more subtle social manipulation than that when it comes to you know, for example, but the this EU is where I say ban political advertising, ban, ban micro targeting in elections, and you know it, it's not easy in some respects because you have the what is a political advert, and there's a debate around that, etc. But how do you do it? How do you ban micro targeting of political parties? Because the messages aren't always political; they're much more subtle than that. Yeah, they're, they're affecting people's. Yeah beliefs and what they feel I know, comfortable with I know I know well that's that's that that is that is a but you start with the basics start with the basics so stop registered political parties and campaign groups um, I, I think in this interim period and you know that isn't it isn't just you know random journalists and politicians saying this the, the, I can't remember the name of it, there's the advertising body, it's an international organisation and it's, it's called for an interregnum on micro-targeted political ads because it just says that at the moment they're unsafe, they need to have a pause and to like, to see, you know, to, meet, to, to have that catch up, the legislation to catch up with the technology. Any side of the political spectrum can, this, you know, it can be used by or can be a victim of and it's really not political in that sense. It really is much, much more about national security and about protecting our democratic freedoms and rule of law. So it's these, everything that has sort of enabled us to, to develop as a country and to become the society that we have is directly under threat now.
Okay, you are now running Facebook. Congratulations. <laughs> you still want this company to be massively profitable. Um, you still want it to be an open platform for people to share and discuss things. What would you do differently from now on? Okay, so my name is uh, Mark Zuckerberg and I've just resigned actually. I've appointed a new CEO. It's absurd that I as an individual should control more than 60% of the com company and make all the decisions. So I've recognised that and I've stepped down. And um, obviously it's absurd the idea that Instagram and WhatsApp and Facebook um, aren't uh, competitors to each other so I'm just going to sell WhatsApp and I'm going to sell Instagram and I'm going to focus on my core product Facebook and um, I am going to take responsibility for uh, for the harms that it is doing. How? So one of the things which I found so disturbing I didn't think I could be radicalized further in terms of my feelings about this, what was happening online. But during the Christchurch massacre, when we were watching in real time as thousands upon thousands of videos were being uploaded to Facebook and uploaded to YouTube, and you could see tens of thousands of views, people all across the world watching this content. And we know, you know, there's this really solid academic literature about contagion and the way that it works. So we know that that content will have radicalised people, and they, might, and they, they were sort of saying, oh well, we're tr you know, it's a problem with our AI. Our AI isn't recognising this content. But then they should have just shut it off. I mean, if you if you if you can't control what's being uploaded, stop the uploads. I mean, I, I don't think that's rocket science. So the extension of that, though, to play devil's advocate, is what happens in other countries when the government decides that what's being uploaded they don't agree with and they shut down the uploads, they cut off the website. And that's called censorship in other countries. So Facebook's argument is it doesn't want to be accused of censoring free speech. Obviously, these videos are not free speech. But, but this is, this is a, yes, one of the really um, amazing statistics about Facebook that I heard is that one in seven people that Facebook employs to do content moderation works on German content. And that's because Germany has very strong laws around hate speech and if you don't get it down you're going to be fined. And, and, and so they have to get it down and they can do it and it's just a question of money. But I mean what's quite interesting, the thing I noticed, so I, I went to a sort of Silicon Valley event earlier in the week and it is quite interesting how Facebook is sort of a, this slightly isolated case, it seems. It seems that even within Silicon Valley, you know, um, people see it as a sort of company apart that's particularly more problematic, more problematic than Twitter, more problematic than Google. Think that is? I don't know. I think, I don't know. It's interesting. I think. Do you think it's just that Silicon Valley is going, this is a toxic brand, I don't want anything to do with it? Or do, they, do you think they understand that there's something fundamental about the way Facebook operates that, that means they're prone to this more than other social media companies? I think that they're, I think that the sort of Zuckerbergian worldview is seen as problematic. And, and again, that comes back to the kind of control of this company, this massive company so much power across the world and with one person and I think you know that's the one of the hugely hugely problematic things about it is that Mark Zuckerberg is obviously a genius and he has built this incredible company but he has huge deficits and 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 things that he's just completely short-sighted about and and doesn't actually have the intellectual capacity it seems to 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 deal with and to have so much power concentrated in his hands. I think even in Silicon Valley that's seen as problematic. Carol, thanks so much for your Oh, time. thanks so much for having me. It's great to be on the BBC. <laughs>